we certainly get small doses of, of isometric work in some of our athletes before they even go out onto the training paddock. And that's generally um, a mixture of moderate to high intensity work, but super, super low volume. And that almost potentiates them with our tendon boys. It gives them some real good relief, obviously, some pain relief to go out and then perform. Um, and then early on in the week, we almost have more of a therapeutic look at the isometrics that they're doing. So still run specific isometrics, but at loads or holds that are more submaximal. So around that 60% type holding ranges, 50 and 60% intensities. And then on their key lift day would be where we go and express those higher forces. So we've almost microdosed isometric training consistently through the week. So rather than getting high volumes and overflowing the bucket, we've dosed it throughout the week where they've been able to get their isometrics in. That was athletic performance coach Alex Natera. You're listening to the Just Fly Performance Podcast, and welcome to another episode. So I'm thrilled to have Alex back on the show. Uh, just a quick background, if, you, if you're not familiar with Alex. He is the Senior Athletic Performance Specialist at the GWS Giants of the Australian Rules Football League. Alex has over 20 years of experience in high-performance sport. Uh, he's a man of many talents and has time spent as a professional sportsman, a technical coach, so he's actually been uh, a rugby coach. Uh, he's been a strength coach, a sports science lecturer, as well as a published scientific researcher. So most of, most of Alex's job has been in the realms of strength and conditioning. And Alex made huge waves about three years ago with an article that kind of broke the internet or at least broke Twitter, broke something, <laughs> but uh, on run-specific isometrics. And this was a system that Alex, Alex created on using uh, overcoming isometrics measured with a force plate that were specific to developing sprinting. And Alex was getting tremendous success using this um, this uh, this method. Uh, at the time, he, he wrote the article, he was at the Aspire Academy working with sprinters, and he was getting tremendous success using that to fill in the gaps of what these sprinters were, um, needed or were missing in their in their specific strength for sprinting, be it at the hip, knee, or ankle. And so if you haven't seen that uh, article as well, I'll have it in the show notes on the primary page for this podcast on Just Fly Sports. So you can be sure to check that out if you haven't uh, been familiarized yourself with that method. But again, the the training was so much different than I think what the common approaches to dealing with sprint athletes in the weight room are. And one thing that I had asked Alex offline before that I really wanted to get into on another podcast was, how did he come up with this? Uh, it was Because I asked him, well, was it a mentor? Did someone kind of teach you this? And uh, Alex has a really interesting story as to how this all came about. And I think it's you could really appreciate the work more. And you can appreciate really how I think the process of how we come up with these really game-changing solutions in the weight room by taking a listen to Alex's story of how he created the run-specific ISOs. Uh, outside of that, Alex has been working, last time on the podcast, Alex had been working more with track and field sprinters. And now, two years later, he has spent uh, a significant amount of time working with the, te the team sport athlete. And for those of you who have been, uh, had work, have worked in both fields or both sports, or even if you haven't, um, the difference between the two is pretty stark. There's, there's pretty massive differences. And there's also connotations that come with that in how, what is the best practice in applying these run specific ISOs to a team sport athlete versus a sprinter. And that's what I was really excited to get into for the show today. So for that, uh, for, so for this episode, Alex is really going to get into the nuts and bolts of his system when it comes to uh, when it comes to working with team sport athletes. We're going to finish with uh, we're going to finish with a little chat on hamstring injury prevention as well. That always goes a long way and is a fun topic too. In many ways, I wish I wouldn't have uh, taken two years to get Alex back on the show. He is a first-class coach. He is a an amazing thinker in the field, an innovator, and the field. I think the field and the athletes we serve are certainly better on account of Alex. So I'm excited to get you guys the show today. Uh, let's get on to it. Episode 201 with Alex Natera. Alex, it's awesome to have you back, and I think. Yeah, in this time of necessity, really, uh, where I think a lot of us are at a little bit more bare bones place than we typically are uh, in, in our own training environments and things like that. I'd like to ask you a little bit of the history of what we talked about last show, which was um, your isometric training protocol. And I'm curious, how did you come up with that? Like, what was the necessity that sparked the, the, the overcoming isometrics in that protocol that you talked about last time on the show? 
Yeah, sure. Look, I think um, there's actually a real spark incident. But before that incident occurred, I was already involved in some form of isometric training through like right back to where I was a little kid. So I was a martial artist um, um, back in the day as a youngster, as a five, six year old, and happened to do a really sort of traditional style of martial arts where you're like, you run out in the wilderness and the and the facilities out in the wilderness and you're you're there on bamboo you know flooring and you're training out there and you're doing all sorts of you know real traditional type work um and uh there was a lot of isometrics back then i remember right back in the day there and and for other kids that weren't doing the martial arts like i just felt like i was i don't know maybe i just had the genetics or whatever as a youngster a six seven eight year old but I always felt stronger than quite a lot of them. But we were just doing, I was doing martial arts four or five times a day. So I was probably just training anyway. But in that martial arts, we were doing so much isometric stuff, real traditional stuff, pushing against your own hands, pushing against objects, other people that were bigger than you and, and that sort of stuff, let alone the, you know, numerous amount of push-ups you do as well or whatever. But so that was the first sort of um, introduction into isometrics. I didn't know it was isometrics. It was just something we had to do kind of thing. And then, um, I guess another key moment was, you know, going into high school, starting to train, starting to lift weights, learning all the lifts and all that sort of stuff and, you know, basically doing most of your traditional lifts. But there was some point in time, and I know you, Joel, used to try and you still do try heaps of stuff, uh, very envious of that. So, But uh, I know you tried lots when you were young too. And so I remember trying, just thinking from a necessity, really thinking, right, well, I can lift the weight up but I could also lower weight down as much as possible. I didn't know anything about muscle actions yet. I haven't learned that yet. And I'm like, I can also hold a weight. And I can do that with different loads at different times. So I'm like, well, why, why am I going to just sit there and do a bench press and then fail pushing it up and racking it off? Why don't I also fail lowering it? So I'll get a spotter and I'll fail lowering it. And then why don't I fail like holding it um, as, as long as I can or with the highest weight I can possibly hold it for? And so I was already playing with stuff then. And, and obviously now you've got, you know, lots of other things coming into the system here. You've got, you know, your growth and maturation, your biology is changing very rapidly and whatever, but nonetheless, you're starting to think, wow, this stuff really works. Like, this is amazing. I'm getting far stronger than everyone else. And, you know, I'm excelling at my sport and so on. So, but, you know, then, you know, I go finish my sport. Um, oh, no, actually, I'm into my sport now as a professional. And one of the positions I played, for the American listeners who might not know, but in the scrum, I was in the scrum. I was in the middle of the scrum where you're literally pushing 8v8 together. Um, there's so much load going through your body. And if you're a dominant scrum, you might start isometrically first and then overcome them eventually and then push forward. But there's not a lot of concentric type movement. It's really a high load isometric. And in my position, I have to strike the ball, kick the ball back to the, the rest of my teammates. So I'm between massive men, you know, over 800 kilos worth of pressure coming at you and I'm having to stabilise on one leg while I kick the ball back. And so it just made sense to me that as I was training, I could squat. I could squat really well. I was a, I was a strong squatter, relatively speaking, and in absolute terms for, for my size. But um, I just started doing more isometric work and it felt like a lot heavier load, felt like the scrum um, and, and therefore, and the transfer was dramatic. From an average scrummager, I ended up becoming quite a yeah. That became a strong point of my game, um, and I, I attest that completely to isometrics. Now it was very specific, right? Um, as in the muscle action was very specific to the to the movement that I needed to do in the game. But then moving along, you know, going into the professional environment in terms of a practitioner working as a strength and conditioning coach, you know, starting to use isometrics in the rehab setting often and. And also in the assessment, you know, the assessment of neuromuscular um, capacities and particular peak force. So that all started coming in really when I started moving over to the English Institute of Sport, which is probably my my biggest development journey, for instance, uh, for example, sorry. And in that time, um, I ended up taking a few people through their rehabilitation early with, with the phys uh, physiotherapist's input, obviously, in the early stages. But then some of the exercises we were doing I'd carry on with for longer because we'd see, you know, you'd go for a period of time where you go, I don't know, six weeks or something doing isometric stuff because that's all they could do in the rehab setting. And then I'd move on to more isotonic work. But I'd actually start keep keep some of that isometric in longer because in my mind I was going, hold on, they're not getting any pain from this exercise. We're actually able to hit really, really high neuromuscular output. So I can work them harder on this exercise rather than drop the weight and become what we thought was more spot specific moving into isotonic type work. 
So that, and then, and then what I was seeing off the back of that was some really promising results. Like people were just coming back a lot quicker and a lot stronger. And so I needed less backfill work of strength training to get them off and, and, and returning to play and returning to um, training. And then off the back of that, we had a little scenario where I was isometric testing a group of youth, like young athletes. And I remember thinking we needed to get some reliable data. And then in our minds, and I know there's been some, some science out lately, research out lately that says it can be quite reliable with really young cohorts, but we weren't finding it very reliable. And so week to week testing isometric mid thigh pull ended up four, five, six weeks. And we were going, I was literally looking back at the data going, I think these guys are getting a training effect from isometric mid thigh pull assessments. They're getting a training effect. So then that I was armed with all of that in my mind, right? But then the real catalyst, the big driver was this time um, I was working modern pentathlon again at the English Institute of Sport and working, inherited this Beijing silver medalist. So she was class above the rest anyway. Um, and she didn't do a lot of strength training. She did the basics, but she had come back off a silver medal and said, her quote, I don't lift, I don't need to lift to, to an Olympic medal. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, coach's quote to me in a really thick Hungarian accent is, she needs more ping. She needs more ping. What does that mean? He tells me when she runs, he wants her feet to hit the ground and come off the ground. That's really important for her. She needs to. And for those who don't know, modern pentathlon um, is is like almost like a biathlon in in uh, snow sports. So there's, in this case, there's running a one kilometer, and then you shoot, and then you run again, shoot, and run again. So actually, running efficiency, being really efficient runner, is really important um, to be able to control your heart rate when you're about to shoot, and so on. So it's actually a really, really important part. And he was like, "No, nah, this girl you know, needs to do this." So then I had to, in my mind, and also with help from like um, great mentors back then, my boss was a guy named Chris McLeod. You know, shooting the breeze and talking about what options might be there for this particular athlete who, who's not going to lift and I'm not really getting the support from the coach to push her to lift and, uh, and I'm really adamant that well to, to create this change you already run anyway you already do running drills already you already do this sort of stuff but you're not having a change we're going to have to strip you back we're going to have to bring you back in the gym and try and improve these qualities and to me looking at running then anyway I never I mean I read it so we read it we understood it and we then applied it and so the reading said that there was an eccentric motion when you run so I believe that because that's what we read but deep in my heart, I just it didn't make sense to me that you could go and lengthen when you're on the ground and then shorten in the flight. I was like, if we're trying to be stiffer, why would that be a, a, a thing that we want to do? Surely we want to be just rigid, you know, and allow tendons and things to work off the back of it. So then when we came to the point, I've actually said to the girl, look, I'll promise you you'll be in the gym for no more than 20 minutes and I promise you you won't lift a thing. And when I said that to her, she went, I won't lift a thing. <laughs> I'm in, let's do this. So she came in and we started training her um, and went for a, a substantial block. And that's all she did. That's all, literally, I promise you, in the gym, that's all she did. Just came in, isometric, mid-thigh pull with one leg, strapped her in. She had a force plate. She was on a force plate, had the laptop in front of her, and she just lifted. And over the time, she got 25% stronger, which is significant. If you get 25% stronger in your squat over, what was it? I don't know. I think it was 12 or 16 weeks. You've done, you've done really well if you're Beijing silver medals. So she got a lot stronger. And then we were measuring certain things like contact time at race pace, contact time, stride frequency, stride length, things like that, running economy and things like this, which also had a really positive shift. So that was my first experience of it. Um, and from there, then it just, it just went on like, like we sort of discussed before. That's 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 an awesome and lengthy and but ever I loved every minute of it because I I say lengthy because I'm trying to go back because there's so many good points I'm trying to remember uh, I the, the isometrics with the martial artists I, I want like if you have like I'd be curious to put that in the show notes like I just tried to picture like you at, like six like pushing against your hands and like like you know like <laughs> yeah and you said like my I, I myself yeah like was doing all sorts of weird stuff when I was like six or ten years old to try to you know improve athletic quality so it's just it's really cool we have that in common and it, it is to me the isometric is such an it's such an interesting thing because i feel like like you said it's like compared to all the other modes of work it's the one that you really do recover extremely fast it's almost like it has more advantages and less disadvantages than all the other modes of work it's like the the safest really wouldn't you say so if yeah i'd 100 percent agree it's the safest and if and particularly um you know, from, from a recovery perspective, 
So if you're if you are one of the rare who are able to really put out and put everything out into an immovable object, then the acute fatigue off the back of that can be quite high. Like you can be spent acutely, but then recover from it quite quickly. Um, and then there's the others who who seem to recover, and that, that's the majority. Majority, as far as I'm concerned, the majority might that can put out might have a big acute effect of fatigue recover quite quickly and, and carry on, you know. Um, but then there is this minority group who can absolutely ruin themselves by doing too much maximal work, so 100% and above, and flatten them out a little bit, like flatten in terms of their reactivity and stuff for, for a couple of days. But that's generally the guys who have done way too much of it. Um, and you don't have to do it that way. There's multiple ways of doing your isometric work, even when it's sort of a push for instance, where you're not able to actually move the object, you can do it fast, um, which is a key. And that's that's one of the things um, I think is actually quite potent with guys who can already put out really well. It's going really, really fast. And then you don't actually get to that peak because the time the time constrains you and you stop and uh, you can recover so much quicker off that. And that's you don't even get acuter fatigue off that sort of that sort of work. Um, but yeah, that, 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 I agree, mate. It's um, it's a, but the soreness off of it is 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 absolutely limited. So you don't get the soreness, you don't get the same level of fatigue. Um, and if you get the third bird lined up to kill it, uh, in terms of three birds with one stone, if it's specific to the action that you're trying to become better at or train or, or adapt at, then you're, you're absolutely laughing. And, and what I'm suggesting is that is that is running, that is upright running, and it's also acceleration, certainly down in the, the ankle particular, the ankle region as well. So if you're, if you're a running base athlete you should be doing some form of this i, I suggest yeah 100 percent. you mentioned and it made me think too like the bob hoffman work and uh in the 60s and and like the, him saying that if you did too much you you ruin your nerve your nerve power gets exhausted i think is the way he put it uh, but the distance runner intrigues me because or a pentathlete i mean she was kind of a distance runner right like running about 3k or 5k or something like that um yep. so what was the protocol then? Twenty minutes of doing that for a, you would think, or at least in my mind, I'm thinking that distance type people, like a more of a distance person, would could get burnt out more easily. You know, like someone who's got like less of a nervous system. I have air quotes, like less nervous system power. <laughs> what what do you? What's your thoughts on the type of people that would get like burnt out more easily, or what was the kind of protocol you're using for an endurance athlete? Yeah, so for hers, I'm going to try and remember this one. Um, and I've got it written down. I'm just trying to look look back at my notes if I've got them somewhere. But um, she was an she was an interesting one in the fact that she. Oh, here we go. Actually, I've got it right here for you. Okay, so yeah, we did um, three sets of three four second uh, pushes essentially. So again, um, and then we we sort of vary that as a, a periodization from eighty to one hundred percent. So depending on on you know, where, where, where we were sort of step loading her, we'd either be working maximally at hundred percent or as low as sort of 80%. Most of the time we we're around that 90% mark. Um, but certainly every, uh, I would say every five or six sessions, we'd be going up to hundred percent. And so if you like, we'd be in a machine on a left leg, for instance, strapped up around our arms, isometric mid thigh pull ready to go. She push for four seconds at whatever intensity we prescribed. She'd then rest for 20 seconds, push with the other leg, rest for 20 seconds, and do that three times as a set. And we do three of those. So that's what her essential, yeah, that was the crux of her training. And we just were consistent with that all the way through. Um, and what we varied was the the intensity, so the, the, the level of maximal voluntary contraction, essentially. So... Yeah, three sets of three four-second holds. So what's that in total um, on each leg? What's that, 12 times three? So just over 30, 36 seconds. And um, and that still today is, for me, for peak work, so like absolute work, that's still around the range that, that, that I suggest. Some of the literature goes much higher than that, 60 seconds, 75 seconds, but you don't see me go for much more than 30 to 40 Um as, as a maximal volume of, of of maximal work, if you like. Yeah, you'd think too, especially for someone who's like a distance runner or 
in uh, the, the book Easy Strength, uh, Dan, John, and Pavel, like they talk about like it's like quadrant four, that person who really has just one job, like just to run. I mean, obviously, you have to shoot too, but if your only job is to run, I, I've been on a big minimalist kick myself lately. Like just, just how can I streamline and optimize given the few pieces of training equipment I have now? And and I, I think especially for distance running, it's, I mean, it's really easy if you're if your job is a strength coach. I think it's really easy to get carried away and have all these little different things, but I. I just think it's so cool to start from one thing and be able to get such a great result from that and something that powerful. So that's a, that's a really cool story. I, I'm also curious, like having advanced it obviously into track sprinters and now team sport, which we'll chat about. Is there anything like, would you, if you could go back in time, do you, I mean, obviously it worked really well. Do you feel like there would have been a better movement, like a, like a, like a single leg plantar flexion or something like that? Or for, I mean, I guess the single leg high pull is probably pretty specific actually for ground contact for a runner. And if you're only going to do one thing. Yeah. Well, I mean, Oh yeah. With, with her, absolutely. Like it, it worked, could have worked better. Yeah. I would have liked much more of an improvement in her, in her running side of things. Um, all the other metrics were going through the roof, which is great, but um, yeah, I would have. And then maybe looking back at it now, I would have, um, implemented but i mean that was a step out though anyway let's, yeah. let's be honest oh, yeah. that was a big step out a big risky move but also a fortunate move because i, I was able to do it because she wasn't going to lift anyway so it was kind of like yeah. right, well, this is what you're gonna do. so it was easy to put in and then off the back of that you go ah and then over the years how can i improve that more now that sort of movement is really heavily knee dominant okay a little bit more with a little bit of hip but mostly knee dominant and so moving from there i could you know I could I could get an athlete, test them in their reactive strength, um, like a drop jump kind of thing, and realize that that knee wasn't contributing a whole lot to their reactivity. So I needed more. That wasn't giving me enough. That wasn't more targeted around that ankle area. So then it was very simple to move to the ankles as well and design the ankle isometric pushes off of the back of that and the holds and all the all the things that just kept off coming off the back of that. Uh, but also I just got rid of the got rid of the necessity to grip a bar and to strap a, pl- a person in all of that just took time. And, uh, and to be honest, not everyone was a, a great Olympic lifter or a great deadlifter, but everyone had done squats before from day dot. It's like the first thing you do from an S and C program, when you start doing basic S C when you're a 13 or 14 year old, you're squatting. So actually that load on their back was man- on their shoulders was m- made much more sense to them. And they were able to almost um, isolate their leg more when they were doing that sort of exercise rather than having any component of the upper body or any need to overcome sort of joint slack before you actually produce force. So that's why we got rid of that and just went straight onto the squat. Um, the one leg ensured that we could have maximal loadings um, uh, because it was only on the one leg rather than two legs and loading up your spine so hard. Um, the one leg helped with that. It was worry about if we were on one leg, whether we'd be on un- un- sort of stable oh, yeah. even through a locked in. But there isn't you, you if you tried it yourself, you just get locked in completely. The forces from ground and bar just almost make you into a nice rigid column and you, you're kind of quite stable there, which is great. But yeah, then went on to the ankles, found a lot of joy out of the ankles um, in making people react more reactive around that area. Uh, and then moved to the to the hips as well. So and then now I could measure all three of them create baselines, normative values. They still need lots of work, don't get me wrong, and they're very different from different cohorts. So when I come into, you know, a team sport environment, I expect a, an, uh, an elite sprinter's um, knee ISO push values. It's not realistic. So, you know, they change for the for the cohorts you're working with, but I essentially can get, you know, baselines, work out what the difference, difference, differences are. So if they're much lower on a certain area, then the focus might be more on that area. Um so I tested someone just before the lockdown and he had an amazing knee ISO push right up there at about 4.5 times body weight. Five is my, you know, the real peak numbers. Um, but his calf isometrics were down and they're they about 2.25 or something. And I'd like that to be up around, you know, 3.75 for that sort of level. So his automatically, I'm like, well, you, you've, got, you've got knees to die for you got ankles to hate. So let's, <laughs> let's, let's constrain your ankles a little bit more. And that's how that sort of, that sort of works. I wanted to take a quick break from the show to share with you a little bit about what our sponsor, simplyfaster.com now has available in their store. You hear me mention in the outro of the show all the time about the free lap timing system in the K box, which I have and use regularly. But today I wanted to share a little bit more about the bar speed monitoring units that Simply Faster has, which is the Gym Aware 
and the new portable flex unit. So let me start with the gymware. I mention it regularly on the show. It's been referred to as the Cadillac of bar speed monitors. Carl Valley calls it a lab inside a lunchbox, as the readings you get out of the gym work go well beyond typical concentric or just up the up phase of the lift velocities. Rather, you can measure the entire shape of the barbell lift in terms of eccentric velocity, range of motion, and total work done. Total work being awesome, by the way, especially like comparing a long-armed bench presser or a 6'10 squatter versus a 5'11 point guard. So you're getting all these extra metrics that you're not getting on other units. It's perfect for teams wanting to manage the weight room and the data synchronizes to software platforms such as Coach Me Plus, Team Builder, and Athlete Monitoring. So new to the store is the Flex, which is the ultra portable and lower price travel version of the coach's favorite gym wear. So just like the gym wear, the Flex measures the shape of each rep, range of motion, total work done, eccentric dynamics, so for this and the gym aware, this is the advantage that a force plate would have over just knowing how high you jumped. You're getting many other metrics and information that go into this unit of work. Compared to similar portable bar speed monitors, this unit gets the entire rep rather than a fraction. So you have here two awesome tools. And if you're interested in upping your game in the velocity-based training and bar speed world, I would definitely recommend heading to the store at simplyfaster.com and checking into these two units. All right, let's get back to the show. Yeah, I didn't know. I, I don't remember if we talked last time about norms, like like a hip norm or a knee norm, to know where's your weak point. I, so you're so you're saying it's about four times body weight on a single leg, like plantar flex. What what were the what are the kind of the norms that say okay, you're like this is about what I want, and if it's not, we focus on here. I didn't know you had those. Yeah, really simple, really simple. And again, it, it's varied. So <laughs> I've seen people go down this track when I've given these norms. And, and I've seen people excel, ex, way over these, way over these. So it's a realistic norm. So a realistic norm, but you're going to have to be bloody strong. <laughs> if you're super, super strong, you'll go over this. And I've seen that in female athletes even. So it's about a five times body weight for your knee iso push, five times body weight. Uh, for your ankle iso push, it's about 3.5 times body weight. And then for your hip iso push, now it's system mass three and a half times the system mass um, system mass is around somewhere between 30 and 35 kilos at uh, 35% that you're supporting at your heel. Um, so when you work that out, if it's, if it's three and a half times that it's pretty simple to think that it's over body weight, essentially, if you're just measuring on the force plate, how much you're, 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 you're able to, to push into the force plate essentially. Yeah, it's that's interesting. You talk about the knee versus the, and obviously it's nice to have. I mean, there's not everyone has a force plate set up, but I think there's ways to be creative with functional isometrics with like the loaded, the huge loaded bar and like just lift it like a half inch or something like that. At least that's my uh, <laughs> what I've kind of sure. tried to make do with. Uh, but I, I think about, um, and I I've been moving. I heard this from um, Cal Dietz, and I've been moving towards it. And I've done stuff like this in the past as well but uh squatting just do regular weightlifting where like the heels are totally off the ground where your feet your balls of feet are on like two plates and you're squatting and i've i've been thinking a lot lately about the differential between your regular squat and then how much you could do with the heels in the air and so it, what you're saying that the difference between the iso the knee iso push and the calf is really just the heel is on the ground or it's not right like you got the bar on your back and you're set up and either you're pushing through the ball of your foot with the heel floating or you're pushing with a full foot. Is that the big difference between the knee and the calf one? Yes, uh, <laughs> but there's a further difference. There's a fur okay. further difference and the difference is with the ankle one, you have to have your knee extended. If your knee's not extended, okay. and I'm talking all the way, then you'll have a lot of quad contribution essentially, quad and, and, and glute. So you need to get rid of that by straightening your knee, so extending your knee completely, and then you can isolate your calf more effectively. Yeah, so that's that's the major difference. Um, and then with your isometric push, so your knee push, then you're you're in a more of a mini squat position, if you like, with heel flat on the ground for sure. Got it. So like 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 twenty degrees or something like that of knee flexion, or thirty, or I should say like one fifty. Is it kind of like a stance a, st a stance level? Um, uh, sprint, like like sprint mid stance level bend or maybe a little below or somewhere in there. That's correct. There's a there, you know I used to measure it every single time and that was ridiculous if you're getting ten <laughs> athletes through. Um, so now you just look at it and you go, yep, that's mid stance. It's you know a softening of the knees. Uh, yeah, it's all it's always confusing uh, talking to you, you. You you obviously know, but you know your shins at an angle, obviously, and your hips at an angle. 
So it can be deceiving, but you know, that it's, it's very much a mid stance. You know, if you're getting around sort of that 30, 40 degree, depending on how you're looking at it, <laughs> knee flexion, you're, you're about there. So um, don't get too hung up on it. But if you look too squatty, then that's not where we want you. And if you look too extended, that's not where we want you. So a little happy medium. Yeah, makes makes perfect sense. Uh, cool. And I hope I hope I'm not re- being redundant with anything I might have talked about last time. A lot of times, like it's just this stuff is so stimulating to me. I, I, hopefully, I did, but uh, I didn't forget anything. But um, it, it, if I did forget, it's cool to hear it again because I'm already thinking about. Honestly, I'm just talking. I'm already thinking about all this stuff that I need to put back in my program. Um, anyway, so in going to. Um, Moving from your work with track a lot and now going into Aussie rules football, uh, so basically sprinters to team sport athletes, what are some of the differences that are happening now, in, or if any, or, or just even, or maybe a philosophical, I don't know, but what are some differences that are happening now versus in just working with pure sprinters? Yeah, look, I'll try not to be as lengthy as my last answer um, that, that I gave you, but look, there's a huge amount of difference, to be honest. Um when we're talking about sprinting, we're essentially talking about the main thing, <laughs> getting from A to B, faster running. And then when we're talking about a team sport athlete, it's one of many, many things uh, from passing to catching to kicking to tackling to changing direction, you name it. There's a lot of other things. So all of a sudden, straight away, the emphasis on the program has to change because there's many, many more things that you have to train and prepare for. Um However, the thing to actually to consider is if they run, they still, like we've just established, they still need to be doing some of this if running is a KPI for them uh, or something that they need to improve on, a running, um, a, a running event in their game, if you like, whether that's running for longer periods of time, whether it's recovering um, uh, and being more efficient when they run or whether it's getting from point A to point B faster. If that's important, then it needs to be addressed. The other thing is, Sprinters and team sport athletes. With sprinters, although we, and obviously having worked in sprinting, although we think sprinters can get quite tired, and they can, um, whether we think that speeders can accumulate fatigue, they can. But when it comes to team sports, it's a whole new level and a very different type of fatigue. They just are always fatigued. And um, I don't care what any other practitioners say, they are always fatigued. My evidence for this is, in preseason, particularly, they are when you test them, all neuromuscular assessments, they're slightly down, but they're getting better because it's preseason and we're slowly getting better. But as soon as they start playing games, when I see it, they go poof and they jump out of the scale. It's like they freshened up because we peaked them to play games. And then we're just busy trying to recover between game to game, apply a certain stimulus and let them express themselves again. And they so then their improvements are like neuromuscular assessments go up again. But then when we go into off season, And they come back after a period of training, boom, they're up there again. So it's almost like fatigue is always in the system and you almost got to clear that fatigue to then see you express what they can express realistically. Whereas sprinters aren't because ultimately they have to perform at a high level all the time. I know some programs are varied. You know, you might not hit your high speeds all the time, but, but generally... Generally speaking, you are hitting very high neural outputs all the time. So recovery is so important and therefore the volume is so much lower and so on. So realistically, mate, it's chalk and cheese between sprinting and and team sport athletes. And then the challenge is how do you incorporate isometrics into that program in a team sport athlete? That's where the bucket's already full. Like it's already full. It's got so much in it. And the, the truth is something has to come out of the bucket to put it back in. And that's what people find really hard to get their head around because we're so we're so aligned and, and and closely connected to what we what we know works or think works that we don't necessarily explore other avenues that might work better. So my you know me coming back into team sports, it's taking something out of the program. And the easiest thing in my control to take out of the program is the volume of heavy traditional lifting to replace it with some of the isometric work and drip feed it in that way. Now that doesn't mean I revolutionize a program completely because if they don't squat and they don't squat at a reasonable depth. I need to find another exercise that's going to prepare them to get into different depths in the game because that's what's going to happen. I can't rely on just the specific um, period in a game to prepare them. That's ridiculous. I need to prepare them to get into that game. It needs to be the other way around to get into that position. So I still need to keep it in, but it's about around balancing when and how you do it. And um, and that's, that's, that's a whole new 
sort of topic of discussion. But, you know, generally how I get around it, just in case you ask that backup question, <laughs> generally how I get around it is um, we certainly get small doses of, of isometric work in some of our athletes before they even go out onto the training paddock. And that's generally um, a mixture of moderate to high intensity work, but super, super low volume. And that almost potentiates them with our tendon boys. It gives them some real good relief, obviously, some pain relief to go out and then perform. Um, and then early on in the week, we almost have more of a therapeutic look at the isometrics that they're doing. So still run specific isometrics, but at loads or holds that are more submaximal. So around that 60% type holding ranges, 50 and 60% intensities. And then on their key lift day would be where we go and express those higher forces. So we've almost microdosed isometric training consistently through the week. So rather than getting high volumes and overflowing the bucket, we've dosed it throughout the week where they've been able to get their isometrics in. Um, another way, and then there's multiple ways of how you integrate your isometrics within your training. But to give it, give a real simple explanation is you might want to look at your isometrics throughout a preseason, for example, in team sport athletes like going from ex it just being more of an accessory lift. So almost uh, a finish the session, light to load, your isometric holds, maybe um, your ankle switches, for example, and maybe your hip isometric holds, for example, at a light to loads, almost, you know, just an accessory lift, if you like. And then that might change and become more of a, uh, a key lift eventually. So meanwhile, you've been squatting, you've been cleaning, you've been doing all that sort of stuff while the isometrics have been an, uh, an accessory lift early on. And then you've moved to more middle of preseason where now the isometrics become more of a key lift. Now, that doesn't mean you don't have to stop squatting, okay? So, for example, if you're going to do a really heavy isometric knee push, then one of the best ways to get warmed up and ready for that is to go do some squatting, okay? So you're going to go maximal axial loading with your single leg. Why not go do some squatting first for that? Get the barbell on your back get ready. Now, you're not going to exhaust yourself on that squatting, but you need to build it up. So I could simply do a three by three, a couple, a warm-up set, maybe two warm-up sets, a higher intensity set. I've got three sets of 80%, sorry, three reps at 80% in there on my back squat load. I've not let go of my back squat. It's still in the program. Anytime I need to bring it in, it's safe to bring it in because it's still being done. And then I can concentrate on a really, really high load isometric exercise as a key lift. And then another way to put it, maybe closer to the season starting, is making it a complex whether you start with your isometrics and it's really short hits, looking more at a rate of force development context, so more of an explode effort rather than a grinding high maximal force effort. But you do that as almost a stimulus before you then get into your other work at the gym and, and, and you can use it as a complex exercise. So you go from a, for instance, a isometric um, calf, so your isometric calf work, straight into your drop jumps, for example, or you go for a, um, an isometric uh, hip hold for example, and then you go into some sort of spanded scissors work, if you like. Um, many, many ways to complex it as well. But that, that gives you an example of how to incorporate it and the fact that you don't have to let things go, especially if you're so um, so attached to them. You don't have to let them go. They're actually useful to warm yourself up for maximal isometric work. Yeah, I like that. It makes me think a little bit. I did an episode probably about 20, 20 shows back. Maybe it was on uh, kind of the, the flow of just it was just talking single leg into double leg like doing more single leg in the early season and then moving into more double leg because that was more neurally intensive i'm doing a lot of air quotes on in this show that people can't see my air quotes <laughs> but, but i feel like it's, it's kind of like the same thing right like start with a lower neural intensity general lifting and then um moving into the ice so the same thing I, I think there's so many um there's so many ways i think to look at that that shift into intensity and neural intensity and I think that's really cool how you how you assign that through the general to specific. Yeah, I think, Joel, to be honest, when I speak to people now, it's not so much, um, oh, look, I, only the people I speak to, like whoever rings me up and wants to have a chat about it, um, they've almost, they almost see the benefits of it and they want, they want to be involved, but they're like, how do I, how do I make this work? How do I, how do I put it in? So most of my discussions now aren't necessarily about um, the concept of why potentially you should do run specific isometrics. It's more around the fact that how do, how do I put it into the program? So you're right. There are so many options and ways you can put it into the program. I, I will say you were talking about in the off season, it's a little bit more uh, general like squats and cleans and stuff. And then the auxiliary, the tail end of the workouts, the, the isometrics. Now, are they still run specific at that point or have you changed the format of the isometrics at all? Or is it going to be the same thing they're going to be doing later, but it's just with the longer holds, like, 
you said like think 20 or 30 seconds or something like that or how how is how how are the is the parameters different when it's in the general phase on the tail end yeah it still runs specific isometrics it's it's lower intensity and and you you bang on it's it's um it's either the pushes like at high higher intensity pushes based on the fact that they've also just finished the the bulk of the training session so naturally it's not going to be the same peak values but we are in a strength phase so we're we're concentrating on on you know the the, the pushes rather than um, uh, the switches or the catches, for example, and the holds are also in there. And again, yes, you, you're bang on more longer time under tensions. Now the 20 or 30 seconds, I, I don't go to, um, that's more of the beginning rehab stages, but mine is more a long hold for me is 10 seconds. And, yeah. I, and my preference is to load it up, um, and then come down rather than go longer. I got you for service. I think I was on 30 seconds cause I was just doing a I was a panelist for this coaches versus COVID uh, talk with some NBA basketball coaches where it was a lot of 30 second holds was the very common talk with like, like a leg extension for tendinopathy. Like there, that was a big thing that was being talked oh, about. Yeah. So maybe that was in my, just kind of stuck in my head. Okay. There. <laughs> yeah. And, and to, to answer you, it is run specific isometrics. And one of the reasons it's run specific isometrics, particularly in team sports is they're running straight away. Um, and they're running it unlike like a track and field program where there's a lot of sort of, um, short to long type progressions. These guys at team sports need to run straight away and you can't control in a drill. You can do as best you can, but you can't control how fast they're going to go. You know, you can shorten, you know, the distance they're going to travel and put parameters around. But as soon as they go into some, a little bit more of open field play, which there will be some of, they, you can't control their speed. So you need to prepare them for their speed. And therefore for me being specific early with the run specific isometrics is, is more important. But don't forget, I think I've, I've said in your article and also probably on podcast too, that there's a big eccentric component too. And I know we're not necessarily spoke, speaking about that now, but that's your ideal time to get this eccentric component working as well. So that's going on along parallel with it. With the, with the run specific ISOs, you mentioned your first, the first person to do this was a distance runner. And I know Aussie rules football, and you talked about fatigue. I mean, my only experience learning about Aussie rules football was, uh, I think Michael Regan was given a talk of, I think he was at Port Adelaide for a while, and he was given a talk at Jay DeMeo's uh, Central Virginia Sports Performance Seminar about how far those guys run, and it blew me away. Like, I think it, he posted, like, how big the field is and how many American football fields could fit inside this thing, and I was I was like, is this, this is crazy. Like, if you took American football players and had them running, like, you know, how, what is it, like eight miles a game or something like or more, it, It's that's a lot, and so... One, I was like, that is, you aren't kidding about the fatigue from my understanding, but I was I was wondering too, if you've found, I don't know if you have a metric for this or just the response, but run efficiency out of these guys, the ability to sustain running over time because maybe they have stiffer springs or anything like that. As, what are some of the, the things that you've noticed or are looking for or trying to find correlations with for the their abilities through all these things that, with isometrics? Yeah, you're spot on. It's a, it's a, I mean, I think our club record's 18 kilometers. I'm not sure what that is in miles, but 18 kilometers in a game. So um, it's brutal the distances that they travel. Uh, and yeah, that is part of, in fact, our whole philosophy around, you know, our, uh, our running mechanics and the way we implement our running mechanics. And, and also this isometric work is to make them more efficient runners um, and essentially to have a, a knock on effect in their, in their, their endurance abilities. So just making them more efficient to be able to utilize their tendons more, to be able to use less um, oxidative cost, if you like, in terms of working muscles. So that's what we do is, is it, it's hard to, hard to establish. Look, we look at different metrics around, you know, the, the percentage of time they spend in different speed zones and different work rates and then off the back of it, how quickly they recover. So essentially if someone's doing more work and then recovering quicker, so when we go to monitor them and they're able to do that, sustain that week upon week upon week across the season compared to what they used to be able to sustain and then their knock-on effect on fatigue, then we know it's having a positive outcome. Now, we don't know what it is. We don't know whether it's the isometric training or the running mechanics or, or the fitness running that they're doing or the way we put our program together to, you know, to, to get good recovery between different elements. Um, but that's certainly a, a way we look and judge it. Um, if I bring it right back to the micro element, obviously I look at things like how their force characteristics are changing in the isometric, um, run specific isometric exercise itself. So their peak force, their time to um, 100 milliseconds, for, uh, sorry, their force at 100 milliseconds, for example, are they able to get 
you know, is their peak force increasing and is the force that they can hit now at 100 milliseconds increasing as well? And I know there's a positive effect there in terms of the isometric work. But is that transferring to sort of reactivity? You know, is their RSI now improving? Is that is that changing? Is that being, um, you know, more effective? And then as a coach, like coaching plyometrics, maybe my my, my background on, on um, in track and field, but coaching plyometrics and watching athletes move all the time, you know, are they improving? Is this now changing? Are they more reactive? Is there more ping? Is there more pop now? Is there a different sound? Is that all sort of starting to come together? Asking them, how do you feel? Yeah, man, I feel like, yeah, I feel lighter. I feel like, I feel like I've got more spring, you know, in the middle of a grueling AFL season, someone's saying I got more spring, you know, so, you know something's working. You you know, something. It's pretty, uh, pretty outstanding. But look, you know, to be, to be honest, I've, I've, I've always wanted to have that sort of technology, uh, whether it's video camera um, and running them at a certain speed um, uh, and, and quantifying that speed and then looking at their, you know, their, their kinematics to see if that's had a, had a, had a change um, to be able to, put force plates out on the ground and those sort of things to see the changes that now is not available to me in a team sport environment where, where it once was obviously in the, in the track and field environment. But, you know, ultimately we'll, we, we see our guys changing their speed um, consistently. You know, we see guys getting faster upon year upon year and we look at our GPS metrics there to, to, to establish that. What is their max velocity now? So that's different now. Obviously I'd allow their laser gun behind an athlete once upon a time and had opt to jump. But now it's relying on other metrics to judge whether they're actually improving. And and uh, but again, finding what's changing it. You know, we don't do a lot of speed work in team sport athletes. Our, our club does. My philosophy is definitely doing speed work. But um, you know, your volume of speed work that you might get in in, in say a rugby team, even or um, a certainly track and field. You know, you know that's probably going to have a well. That is the key driver in having an effect. Whereas here, if other things are changing their speed we know that potentially this supportive work like isometrics might be having a good uh, change in their speed you're listening to the just fly performance podcast brought to you by simply faster alex one thing you were talking about this and i really uh, this stuff resonates because i i had done a little bit of this before i think our the, you wrote the article in the for me, um, for just like sports about the, the Q and a with all, with your methods and all that. And I, one thing I used to do is I used to do a French contrast circuit where I would start with like a heavy quarter squat partial and like, it would do French contrast. So the lead off, instead of a squat, I would just do like a, just a quarter squat and just keep throwing plates on. And it was cool. Cause I was able to get, you know, for me being able to put over 500, I feel cool and stuff like that and, uh, and whatnot. Um, and and then I would superset that with some explosive stuff. And I love that. I like that more than just doing traditional up and down squatting in the French contrast. And I, so I started eventually saving that and using it for like a peak, like the peak phase would be, and that's kind of like what you were doing too. You save the ISOs a little bit and they're, they're formed for a peak. And you mentioned that you were doing a drop, um, you were doing like, like the plantar flexion goes well with like an RSI, like a quick drop jump. Was there any, is there any other, um, like favorite contrasts you have? Like anything with the hip, uh, the, the hip, uh, I, I feel like there's some good stuff with like the max hip ISO and stuff like that. Is there any other favorites you have? Yeah. Well, yeah, I got lots. Um, but like the hip one I, I was mentioning is sort of banded scissors stuff. So you could, or just go straight to the straight scissors. So C skips, C scissor drill kind of thing. So you go straight from your hip iso holds or whatever you're doing there, hip iso switches, for example, and then you go straight into your C, um, C skips. Um, something like your, your knee work, you could go uh, either from, yeah, so do your knee iso and go straight into sort of a, a box drive, a small box, 15 centimeter type box, wooden box, and you're driving your foot down into the ground and, and you know, typical track and field exercise, hey. that sort of thing. Um, uh, yeah, this, it's, it's, it's really just being creative and just, just trying to work out you know, what you've just developed or what you've just primed and then what's going to be able to sit alongside it, which is going to have an effect. So there's no point obviously going from a, you know, a, a knee ISO push to a, to, to a, a drop jump because they're just not working the same sort of muscle group. So I guess, yeah, they're, they're my favorites. I like, I do. So if I was going to give you three favorites, <laughs> they're my favorites, you know, start on the ankles from the ankle ISOs, Going over to do some sort of drop, drop jump, one one leg type drop jump, for example. Hip isos, yeah, I definitely like going into some sort of C or scissors, scissors movement. And then for my knee isos, I definitely like going into some sort of drive onto the box and, and jump up, or or even an, even an athlete step up or a sprinter step up type type movement. 
Yeah, I love it. Yeah, that's good stuff. I yeah, the the squat was the only one I did. I never got too creative beyond that until um, you did the Q and A, and then I talked to you for the first time on the podcast, and then I was able to get some more ideas going. And uh, yeah, it's good to uh, it's good. Well, to it's hear. it's team sport athletes seem to love that. Like it just like it just makes sense to them. It's almost like they've won that, that potentially is potentiation is potentially a warm up, right? So yeah. so you've gone and warmed that body part up. It's functioning how it's supposed to. I'm not going to say it's activating because because of what the context that brings, but um, it's it's functioning the way it's supposed to. It's wide, it's ready to go, and now you're putting it into more of a specific movement, and it just makes sense. It makes sense to the athlete cognitively, but it also makes sense coordinatively as well. The body just gets it, and that's why it expresses better. Alex, you, you had said, uh, and actually I had almost forgotten to ask you this, but you you had said I think you said something about you don't have a force plate now, or do you, do you have a force plate with your team sport? Like you had said something as if you don't have that. Uh, Sorry, in, embedded in in like the ground. Oh, on the track. I see. Oh, in yeah. the track. Oh, in the track. Yeah, I yeah. figured because I figured you did. I was gonna ask you if you had any um, like like the best alternative because I think on the last show you had said that if you don't have a force plate or you don't have something to do this you lose like 10 percent basically because you're just pulling into nothing and there's no you know and so i was i was just curious because i i i was like oh you don't have you know i would assume you do have something there right so okay yeah and definitely do like so my my idea i mean this, this is what i do when i don't have it i go okay what sort of athlete is this to me? You know, I see them lift all the time, squatting, deadlifting. Are they strong? Are they not? Now, if they're strong, and let's talk about the knee, for example. Remember my my threshold or my 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 thing my 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 measure is five times body weight. So I'm like, this guy's already squatting two point two times body weight. I reckon I can start with five on the bar there, and he might even shift it. And then I'll put that. Or this guy's only squatting one and a half times. Guy or girl is only squatting one and a half times body weight. Do you know what? I'm going to put three times body weight on this bar because they're, they're, they're not that strong. And then I'll actually ask them. So I've got no idea what their force output is um, in terms of a force plate reading. So then I'll ask them, shift that bar. I want you to shift that bar. I just want it to come up a little bit. And if they can't, I take weight off. Okay. If, if it doesn't look like it's gone anywhere, if the bar's not even bending, <laughs> I'll take a lot of weight off. If the bar's bending, then, you know, I'll take a little bit less weight off. And, and I'll find a happy medium where um, I've got them and, and, and the best is to do it with something they can lift because once they can lift it, it gives them a sense of accomplishment. And then you can put weight on rather than put weight off. And so you'll get to a point where that bar just gets shifted and then a point where the bar doesn't get shifted. you got your peak value then. And then from there you can plan everything off the back of that on all three of those exercises. Awesome. Yeah. And that makes so much sense too. like they need to succeed too, because like the mental things that go with, you know, succeeding versus failing. It's like you get slapped in the face. You can't even budget, you know, versus I did this. I moved it. And yeah, uh, it's awesome. And uh, yeah, so because, yeah, not everyone, clearly not everyone has a four split. So it's nice to be able to have that plan B if if that um, if that is the case. Uh, Alex, I wanted to ask you a little bit about hamstring issues. So I know obviously probably a really big deal in working with track athletes or a huge deal. And I'm sure a huge deal in your current role as well. So what are some things that you're doing or from maybe isometric or maybe just a general perspective on tackling hamstring injuries? Yeah. So I guess the first thing to establish like we did earlier on the differences, um, but now it's really thinking about the hamstrings. So what are the difference between a sprint um, sprint athlete or a sprint program and a, and a team sport program? Well, again, that sprinter is getting speed work in regularly throughout the year, throughout the week, um, multiple times. And that speed work is of a high intensity nature. Yes, it might be as low as 85 or 90%. Um, and sometimes it's, depending on the program you're working in, it's 95 and 100% more regularly. But they're always getting that dose. And that dose is a high intensity dose of hamstring eccentric work um, and isometric work when you're running. And off the back of that dose is a whole range of adaptations in the hamstring. You know, fascicle lengths. We know that sprinters have longer fascicle lengths, whether that's hereditary or genetic, sorry, or whether that's trained induced. And we, we know that is, it is also trained induced. Um, plus, we know that hamstrings are strong in most sprinters, relatively speaking, versus other athletes. So working in sprinting, um, doing the, the Nord board and the Nord, Nord, Nord work science, Nordics are a fantastic exercise. Doing it in sprinters, I, I personally... A good sprinter, I'm not 
ever failed at them looking like they could hold their Nordics forever. Really, they're just they're just strong, and for sure because of the sprint exposures and also that hamstring work, they're getting long fascicles. So they they don't fit the common science that we've got the research out at the moment. We need more research on sprinters because they just don't fit it. So they're almost getting two things. They're, they're also getting this risky dose because that's the way you tear your hamstring, running really, really fast. <laughs> and they're also getting the protective dose of always doing that. So they're a different beast, Okay. Because they're getting the specificity, specificity all the time in sprinting, I feel they need more of the general work. That's how you complement their training, by doing the general work. Now, does the general work mean Nordic hamstring, hamstring curls? No, but do I do it with them? Yes, I do. Um, one, because I can see the numbers. There's all these technology around it, which is great. But I actually prefer to work in variety around their proximal and their hamstring work throughout a season. And we can do that with a sprinting group because the volume of work and the bucket isn't so full of all these different things going into it. So I actually can get a good stimulus out of creating some level of variation, and that becomes their adaptation. Rather than go, we stay on Nordics to increase fascicle lengths. Well, the fascicle lengths aren't going to change anymore. There's, there's a certain level, you know, <laughs> yeah, we're yeah, going to yeah. get stronger. Well, there's a certain level. I've got guys holding 20 kilos now and being in complete control of their Nordic. Like, we've got to move on. The variation has to be the important thing with a sprinter. Now, with a team sport athlete, it's, it's completely different. Now, you've got an athlete, A, that is, like I established, is pretty much always tired, Okay. Um, you've got an athlete that's covering huge volumes. The bucket's already really, really full. You've got an athlete that's continually getting knocks and bumps and bruises and, and changing their gait consistently week to week all the time. Might not be obvious to the eye, but we know as coaches, if they've got a hematoma on one leg uh, one week or it's only a little cork or, or they're a little bit tight in their Achilles this week or their knee's feeling grumbly, they're changing all the time their kinematics. And that creates a risk in and of itself. Plus they're tired. Now, the other, the major thing that most team sports are, and it's getting better nowadays because the evidence is coming out, is they're not getting regular exposures to speed and high speeds often enough. And yet, they're probably most team sport athletes have been doing hamstring work to die for for years, whether it's concentric, whether it's now eccentric, certainly. But what they're missing is that sprint exposure and the careful manipulation of sprint exposure and uh, isolated hamstring work, like in a Nord curl, for example. So it actually, it's different from the team sport athlete. They need to shift over into, you know, more running mechanics focused and and developing their, their, their you know, their exposure to speed. Um, and what's interesting too with the, with, the, uh, with the team sport athlete is if we're trying to improve running mechanics and it should, for me, it should be, a, a, a large part of any program. It is in our current program, um, and I know a lot of people either just tick box it um, or don't do it at all in other team sports. Now, I think it's an essential part. Now, it's not so much around is that going to change their mechanics on the field because that's a process that takes years. You know, I, I can categorically say out of my, my players at the moment, one person has been able to transfer that in such a short period of time that it's blown my, way, blown my mind. This happens to be the same sort of bloke who would go to every meeting with a notepad um, I'm going to have a meeting with Alex today and have a notepad and write three pages out for his own. Like, it's that sort of in, intense guy <laughs> who could just correct it, who could just transfer it, who can think about multiple things and get it sorted. So, But the rest of the guys aren't. But, however, what you can do, one of the biggest risk factors in in um, in team sports is, is you know, the, the, the distance that you're covering over, over that last 30% of your maximal output, your maximal speed. So from sort of, you know, 66% to 100%, that speed. And if that's a spike and games can present a spike, training, you know, un, you know badly planned training might create a spike, um, you have to react to that spike off the back of it and change your program accordingly. But more than anything, if you're training and you're eliciting speeds in that zone there, if you can run with better mechanics in that zone when you're at training, you save yourself. And what I call what what I try and what I'm trying to explain here is the fact that you can do messy running with bad mechanics. And say you take a thousand ground contacts with bad mechanics at your training. So you're 15 15s, your interval work or whatever. You take a thousand bad mechanics. That thousand bad foot strikes leads to another thousand the next week, another thousand the next week, another thousand the next week. And accumulation of all of that creates a big hamstring risk, in my opinion, right? Now, if you can make that running better, because you can, you can coach it, you can do it live, you can go from running mechanics into that running and make it less dirty, all of a sudden those thousand contacts 
either a zero or three or 400 or whatever. And the accumulation of really bad contacts and the stress that that's going to going to apply on the body makes it um, a, a better environment to develop. And the other thing, the final thing with the team sport athletes is the fact that their ankles um, aren't great, you know, compared to a, to, to, compared to a team uh, sprinter. So actually focusing on making them more reactive and that, how that affects the rest of the running cycle and the running gait is absolutely essential. So that plyometrics in the program, the isometrics, of course, run specific isometrics around the ankle is absolutely crucial for hamstring injury prevention or a, res- a more resilient hamstring or my biomechanically sound running gait to, to avoid some of the hamstring injury issues that we have. Yeah, as you were as you were talking about the importance of the running mechanics for the team sport, I was thinking to myself, yeah, those those run specific ISOs have to be a really big part of that that equation. And like you said, yeah, the that team sport athlete is probably not going to have as strong of feet nearly. Well, probably just not as strong of everything as a sprinter, but I know the feet, especially like just the way that their feet hit the ground, that initial spike of force is just not quite what a sprinter is. So it's it it's cool to probably think about i'm thinking about like your program working in tandem the the technique and then the the strength that goes with the run specific isos that's awesome man i i think it's it's really interesting i i also what you said with the sprinters was cool uh, like and jb marin had said something like this to me i'm I'm not sure the study exactly but he had said basically like high speed or max speed sprinting and nordic hamstrings like the stimulus was actually not that different like like you had said like with the sprinters they don't need to do nordics that much just because it they're getting it like they're getting it and it's just just it just is really cool to be reminded and hear that and that, that same thing jb told me in a little different context there and that's that's uh yeah i, I that's really uh it's really an, a very thorough and, and interesting way to look at it with the with the running and all that and i, I hear you too with the Sometimes it does take a while for the the technique to really develop. Do you, do you think too, especially like in Aussie rules, like you're you're running so far. You said 18 kilometers. Like it's probably really hard to wire in good running habits when you're doing so much. When the game is kind of a lot of junk running, right? You know what I'm saying? Like it's probably really diff- more difficult than most sports, I'd imagine. Absolutely. That's why you've got to look after the conditioning and the fitness running element of it. That's where you're going to have your biggest bang for buck. And they will cover many, many. Look, you know, we might. You know, Drills can't take you. You can only do so much football drills. They won't cover. You won't cover a session of ten to fifteen kilometers worth of football drills, um, as in like football training. So whatever that sport is, you'll only get halfway there. So then the rest of it, if you want to get game like loads that you're preparing them for, will have to come out of your your empty running. You know your fitness running, your intervals and stuff. So then that's where you can exercise control, and you can sell that to any group like. Running well initially comes at a huge metabolic cost, okay? So they're not used to it. They have to concentrate on how they're going to run. It comes at a cost. It's more tiring. It's the easiest selling point. Professional athletes love to work hard, love to get a, you know, get fitter, love to get, you know, get in a better position to pay their game. Boys, I know you just want to run, but guess what? Now I'm going to make you run properly in these in these working sets and it's going to be harder. How good is that? Your opposition's not doing that. Your opposition's just running. They're just belting themselves. We're going to belt and get an extra addition. We do that when it's hot too. Boys complaining how hot it is. We're like, do you realize the adaptations you're going to get? You beauty, aren't we lucky that we got heat to to um to, to work with us as well from a physiological perspective? And uh, our boys seem to buy into it. So if I say if we say run well and in the heat, you beauty, we've got the biggest stimulus than the boys down south in the uh, in the cold climates. They can't get this stimulus that you guys are getting. They buy into it pretty quickly too. So. I, I love the flip there, making the 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 lemons into lemonade, so to speak. Or it's just, yeah, I love. It. It's funny too. It's kind of flip for us because you know, if here it's in the north where it's cold, so it's kind of uh, for both ways. But anyways, Alex, hey man, that's uh, I think that's the end of the list of questions I had for you today. So thank you so much. That was an awesome show. I really enjoyed hearing all your answers. Oh, good to speak to you again, Joel. It's always a pleasure, mate. <laughs> That wraps up another episode. Thanks for being here with us. And that show was like uh, getting the, like the last time Alex was on, it was like you got the middle of a story. And so it was nice to tack on like that first chapter and then the the epilogue, so to speak, hearing how the origin of the isometrics, how he's using them with team sport athletes. And what a great show. Alex is an awesome coach. It was great to have him on. If you enjoy this show, you can help us out by leaving us a rating or review on iTunes, Stitcher, whatever you're listening to. 
As always, we want to uh, give another shout out to our sponsor, simplyfaster.com, suppliers of high end training technology. They have a great blog and tons of awesome training training tools, not just for the team, but also the individual in their online store. So be sure to support them. That does it for this show. We'll see you guys next week. Have a good one.